Hi, I'm Femi O.K. and you're in the stream. Today, the FIFA Women's World Cup is underway in Canada. Records have been broken, history is being made, but coverage of the event hasn't had nearly the same impact as Brazil 2014. What will it take to improve the profile of the women's game? So I am still recovering from seeing Nigeria lose against the USA, but it's okay. I will get through this show. Um, <laughs> but I did manage to find the Women's World Cup right. on TV, mm -hmm. online, so I could actually watch it. It was a bit of a search, but I found it. What's happening without the A bit of audience? a search is exactly what people yeah. are talking about. And so for those who are interested in watching the games but don't know where to go, there's mm. one hashtag they can check out. That okay. is WWC2015. So to take a look at my screen here. These are all the short video clips or vines that have been uploaded underneath that hashtag. You can see celebrations, favorite moments, all there. And there's lots more where that came from. But of course, we want you to use the hashtag AJStream to let us know what you think. Hi, I'm Shaka Hislop, former footballer for Trinidad Tobago and current ESPN analyst, and I'm in the stream. 24 national teams are currently competing for the Women's World Cup, but unlike other FIFA stories that have dominated headlines for weeks, coverage of this event and the players hasn't reached the same level of intensity. More than 30 million play the sport around the world, and it's becoming increasingly popular every year. These figures would suggest that there should be a level of parity with men when it comes to women in the sport. But research shows it's not happening. Take salaries, for instance. This is Brazil's captain and star player, Marta. This week, she scored her 15th goal of all of her World Cup appearances, breaking previously held records. Her salary, though, for the Swedish club that she plays for was said to be less than $200,000. That is less than a week's salary for Real Madrid's Cristiano Ronaldo or Barcelona's Messi. Or we can look at winnings. This year's winning team will take home $2 million. That's up $1 million from the last tournament, but pales in comparison to the $35 million the men were awarded in Brazil 2014. So today we're going to talk to some players, some officials, some fans about the women's game. In Vancouver, Canada, Tatiana Haney is FIFA's Deputy Director of the Competitions Division for Women's Football and is a former player with the Swiss national team. In Edmonton, Canada, Anne O'Dong is a founder and editor of in chief of the women's game. That's a website dedicated to women's football. And from Starkville, Mississippi, Rachel Allison is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Mississippi State University and has written extensively on women's football. So let's let's get to Women's World Cup 2015. And you're there, you're covering the tournament. What is the atmosphere like? The atmosphere is great within the tournament. I think we're kind of in that Women's World Cup bubble, but um, we were in Winnipeg, and Winnipeg was um, the host of four matches for Group D, which was dubbed the Group of Death. Yes. And so you had some dun, really... Dun, dun. <laughs> you had some great teams there and some fantastic football, and the fans really did come out in force. There was 31,000 and 32,000 um, for both matches. Fantastic atmosphere, and all around downtown Winnipeg, there was... Lots of um, things in relation to the Women's World Cup. So really, really enjoyed being in that hub for that time period. What made it the group of death? I know that the US Just, was in it, Nigeria was in it. Those are the two that I was most obsessed with. Who else was in it? <laughs> what, what made it like, OK, if you're in that group, uh-uh? Yeah, it made it the group of death just yeah. because of the fact that you had three top ten nations, USA world number two, Sweden world number five, yeah. Australia world number ten, and then you had Nigeria, who are the African champions. They're world number 33, but in uh. all honesty, they would definitely be a top 15 nation if they played more matches. Yeah. So by the way the football was played, you just saw it, it was the strongest group nice. in the whole tournament. But well, Tatiana, you heard Anne say that the fans were out in force. We're also hearing from some fans online, and this is what they're saying. This is uh, a Mario who says, I'm in Vancouver and we're not getting enough coverage. Only CBC shows Canada's games, and the rest are extra $10 to cable TVs. Uh, this next one is online. This is John on Twitter who says, great seats for tonight's match. And this is uh, uh, hashtag Canada Red, and you can see there the stadium. 
this person is actually excited. I don't think he's doing this sarcastically, but you can also see uh, a lot of the seats are empty. So Tatiana, are you happy uh, with the turnout and the attention that this has gotten so far? Yes, I think we're really happy. I mean, I, I know and we saw it by ourselves that not all matches are sold out and some of the matches have maybe a bit lesser number of spectators. But we also had fantastic numbers overall. The number of spectators uh, is close to what we had in Germany in, in 2011, already now in the middle of the tournament. And by the end of the tournament, we will definitely have more spectators than ever. But also, I think for the media and TV coverage is, is even more important because with that, you really reach the world. After the first group matches, we did some analysis and a, a few stations broke all the records uh, right. compared to 2011 already right. in the USA, in Germany, in England. Many more people watched it uh, on why, TV why or in social media. Why do you think that media. is, Tatiana? What is it about this year, this tournament, that has, has made uh, record-breaking viewing figures, record-breaking attendance? I think it's a combination of a few elements. This sport itself has, has developed again in the last four years, as it did already since 8 and 12 and 10 and 15 years, and it will continue to develop. So it has really just improved so much. The top teams are fantastic teams, great players, it's professional women's football, and the world and the spectators start to realize that and accept that. But linked to that is also the TV production, which I have to say FIFA puts a lot of money into that project to really make sure we have great coverage with 20 to 24 cameras, you know, from a spider cam to, to everything what we have at the Men's World Cup as well. And wow. this makes just the viewing experience so much more fun. And uh, I also have to say some of the TV stations put a lot of efforts into it as well to make great um, coverage like Fox Sports, who does pre-match, post-match coverage, interviews with players, studio guests. So all these things we have never had before in that range. And that just really makes sure people are excited uh, and want to watch it. But I think, first of all, also the quality is really good. Rachel, what is I it? I so agree. Yeah, go ahead, Anne. I have to agree with Tatiana, and um, that's one of, I think, the the main um, women's football community always has an issue with is is access to the matches. And this World Cup, more than any other World Cup, I know in my own home nation, they're showing all of the matches, and they're available online if you want to stream them, as well as on the main TV channels. So just access to the games makes people get involved in the tournament from the very beginning. So then when it gets to the knockout stages, um, everyone knows the teams, they know the players, they know the characters, and also the production value is, is is excellent and FIFA has to be applauded for giving a minimum of 20 cameras for every match. It's been fantastic. And then you get to start to get the really right, good so, highlights. So a lot of coverage, a lot of cameras. What are the stories that we're not hearing though? Because when I was following uh, the Men's World Cup last year, there was a meme a day, in fact, a meme an hour about some story and this player did this and that player said that and, and this happened. And then I was like, there's a ton of things that are just overwhelming on social media. I, I, I'm not hearing those stories. What are you hearing, Anne? I think it just takes time to get to learn the players. Yeah. I mean, one of the things with the World Cup is that a lot of those players play club football. Um, right. There's a very sophisticated men's club football scene. So by the time you get to the World Cup, you know exactly who the characters are. Yeah. You're learning that during the World Cup. And I think you'll see that in the latter stages so of the So in the, the first tournament. week of the game, of the tournament, what's the biggest piece of drama that you covered on, on your website? Uh, the biggest piece of drama, we, we actually haven't had any yet because it's been a really positive story for us in, in the way Australia has played during the tournament. So most of the talk has been just about how well the Matildas have played um, in, in a group where they were anticipated not to make it out. Mm. Well, it's interesting. So two of the points that you raised for me, actually, you got a response online. Uh, this nice. is Live Bets Online, and they yeah. directed us to this hashtag where there are memes and other things yeah. um, following this. It's FIFA WWC. Uh, Live Bet says it'd be great if we could promote that official hashtag. But one of the stories that people online are talking about is this next tweet. This is Maza. We saw this in the headlines not too long ago, and it's still there. Maza says, women don't have real glass grass to play on. Rachel, you were there not too long ago at the World Cup. Is this still a concern for players? Absolutely. I was also in Winnipeg for the opening matches. And I mean, as Anne mentioned, the atmosphere itself was, was electric and there's so much to celebrate. And yet we, we can't lose sight of the ongoing controversy over the 
um, lack of grass fields for the tournament. I know that this is something that Abby Wambach has continued to comment on in media. And, you know, I think actually that the, the turf issue has a silver lining. And that is that for the first time with a Women's World Cup, we're seeing greater attention and more conversation devoted to the issue of resources for the women's game. And we're seeing a, a growing community and a unity among not just players, but fans and coaches and trainers and media personnel um, around the, the worth and value of this tournament. So Rachel, how are they doing that? Are they having that conversation offline? Are they bringing mm -hmm. it up in the post post game analysis? How are they having that sure. conversation? How out, out, out in the open is it? Yeah, I think it's very, very much out in the open. Yeah. I think that certainly that, that conversation is happening in media and especially on social media. That Social media has been a platform that has brought together players and, and staff members, coaches with regular fans. Um, and we, we have seen that as well in the, the National League here in the U.S. All right, so let me give you an example. I've got a pie chart here. And this, mm. this is about how much development money is going into men's football and how much development money is going into women's football. So... Uh, uh, you're going to gasp here. Okay. Uh, less than 1%. So we've got 13 million for into development money for women and then 1 billion for money for the men's game. That is that is problematic, Tatiana. How how do you um how do you take that on? Because I think the minute you say that you're from FIFA, people are like, well, it's FIFA. FIFA should take care of this. FIFA needs to help promote the game. What is your response? Yeah, I, I would uh, just say that it's obviously a, a huge difference between men's and women's football. And I also think we should not compare it at all. Um, first of all, men's football is so much more developed and has a much longer history. And it's really the income uh, driver for FIFA and I think for most of the football associations and sports organizations, men's football makes the money. So this then cross funds the women's football and women's football is not yet at the point where it does make too much money. I think yeah. we will get there. And we should get there and this World Cup shows that women's football is a market and we should look at uh, marketing strategies how we can sell it better mm -hmm. but right now men's football funds women's football so um, there's a huge discrepancy so Tatiana, I, I agree if with men's that, football totally. funds women's football the women should be laughing right they should have amazing kits and amazing facilities because the men's game makes a lot of money yeah, um, that's true. But I mean, again, for FIFA, I think we have to see what is FIFA's role. We can't influence all the football associations. We can't tell them what to do. And uh, again, our main objective is to develop women's football worldwide. Mm -hmm. And here we see the peak of women's football. And even within those 24 teams, you have huge differences if you look at their uh, preparation for the tournament, the number of matches they had. Give us an example, uh, Tat Tatiana, because I mean, you played national level. You didn't make it to a World Cup. but. Give us an example of a, a challenge that one of the teams that are currently at the World Cup have to go through. Yeah, sure, with pleasure. I attended, as an example, the press conference from the team of Ecuador after mm -hmm. their match here in Vancouver when they lost to Switzerland. And I was really impressed by the coach, the young female coach they have. Uh, she really brought it to the point. She said, we are not at the same level. The infrastructure in Ecuador is totally different. The players are purely amateur. The number of players they have is in the in a few hundreds. Mm. Uh, the preparation the team has is just, you know, a, a, an international match here and there against the same teams, but they don't travel internationally. And it's just the, the level for them is so different. And yeah. if, of course, once they're here, it's hard for them to play on the same level. So for FIFA, the main objective is really develop women's football worldwide. Mm. And if I take a number out of the 209 member associations, I think 150 around are totally underdeveloped when it comes to women's football in terms of structure, resources, importance, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we try to work on and that's where we try to have an impact. Well, Anne, I'd love you to pick up on that with this challenge that people raised online. This is Andy and there's quite a few people like Andy who are saying similar things. Ladies, it's true, he writes, you can't match the skill level of men, stop acting like you can. And so there are other people saying, well, we don't watch women's games because it's not as skilled. Here you have a pushback though from Tom. He says, don't let anyone try and say it's a quality of play issue. Women can do almost everything the guys can do. Sky shots, 30 feet over the net, blast free kicks into the wall, play opponents on side. The women's game is just discriminated against and it's part of that fantasy that women are inferior to men so Anne, you're a fan you watch this uh, would you like to weigh in on this this discrepancy there between these two people 
I always talk about it um, in relation to, I guess, um, comparing men's leagues across the world. Like, not every league is the Premier League or La Liga or the Bundesliga. But that doesn't mean you don't enjoy the league that is in your own nation. And it's the same with women's football. It's it's a different type of game. Um, a lot of the players, yes, they're not as physically fast. They're not as physically strong as the men. But they learn how to play the game differently. I mean, you watch the likes of Japan, the likes of France, the way they're so te technical and tactical. It's a different kind of game. If you're always comparing, yes, you're going to find differences. But if you're watching the games as they are, um, they're fantastic. And, and as Tatiana said, in the last four years, the development of women's football has been incredible, witnessed by Cameroon making it through to the um, to the knockout stage. Sorry, Tatiana, at the expense of Switzerland. <laughs> but they played fantastic football. And in London 2012, um, they, they conceded seven goals and couldn't score one. And there's a, a moment in World Women's World Cup history that is seared in your brain. That takes us back to 2011, that World Cup. Japan was playing USA. There's a moment you picked that you wanted to share with our viewers. Why did you pick this moment? I know I'm going to play it. I picked this moment because Asia is the most populous area um, in the world. And this moment, Hamara Sawa, the captain of Japan, uh -huh. it was the 117th minute and she scored an incredible oh, wait, goal. Wait, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. It's 107 oh, minutes. All right, all right. That's where we're going to that's where we're gonna that's pick where we're up gonna the game. game. Okay, have a look. Okay. Have a look what happened. Oh, yes. Oh, that was a, that was a, that, uh, we're all smiling here looking at that. That was a great moment and also special because Japan had just had the tsunami. It, it was an emotional moment for, for Japan as well. Um, and that you remember, you remember that particularly. Um, there's a couple of things that I think are really important. We're talking about this World Cup, how it's grown. What happens after this World Cup? I'm feeling that mm. there's, there's a, a, a lot of buzz. People are interested, people are getting interested. Mm. Rachel, then what happens? Let's take a sort of like fast forward six months from now. What happens? Absolutely. I, I think that many times, especially in the United States, when we've seen these major cultural moments happen for the American team, like Abby Wambach's, you know, stoppage time goal in 2011, we expected to see that attention, that investment mm. um, translate into increased investment and attention for the National League. Yeah. Rachel, do you and mind if I play that goal? Is that okay? You, no, you just dropped do. in a player there. Uh, mm -hmm. And Abby Wambuck, she's important because she plays for the USA and you, she's important because why? Uh, well, sh she is important. Um, I think she is a link between the past of this team and yeah. the future. Um, I And she's a veteran. And I think that Absolutely. She's a veteran of the, the national team playing in what was likely her last tournament. All right, set this up. We're 2011. The U.S. is playing. Go ahead, Rachel. Do, do the commentary. The, US is, um, the, U the United States is playing um, Brazil in a semifinal. It's in stoppage time. They're down one to two. Take a it breath. Looks as if Let's play the clip. Okay. <laughs> And the crowd goes wild. Rachel, that was a very memorable moment, but what was the bump? Is there a bump of the Women's World Cup? There is, absolutely. I was with one of the um, national professional teams here in the US at the time, and there was a spike in attendance and attention given to the National League after the Women's World Cup. And yet it was relatively short-lived. And that is a trend that we have seen after almost every international tournament, and the, the Olympics included, that we seem to be more willing to give attention and investment to women's soccer when national pride is at stake than we are on a more routine basis. Mm. Rachel, you're not the only one that thinks that. I have a video comment here from Andrew out of New York. I want you all to have a listen to what he had to say. My name is Andrew Jones, and I'm a reporter for the news site The Intercept. And the main problem that faces women's soccer after covering it for so many years is maintaining the enthusiasm after the global competitions such as the World Cup and the Olympics, especially 
when it comes to watching women's soccer at the club professional level, whether it's the NWSL here in America or the UEFA Champions League in Europe, is that consistent attention and enthusiasm for the casual fan is still something that has to be translated for these women athletes when they play their club professional soccer. So Tatiana, how do we reverse that trend that Andrew and Rachel were talking about? How do we make the momentum keep up after the World Cup? Yeah, I think we have to be realistic. In 2011, uh, especially in Germany and Europe, the expectations were very high that the success of the FIFA Women's World Cup would translate immediately into the club structures and the leagues and the Bundesliga. And afterwards, there was a bit of a disappointment because it, it did not happen uh, as, as expected. And I think this time it might be similar. I don't think that the, the leagues will, you know, from today to tomorrow, just have 100% uh, more spectators or something like this. It's just, uh, it takes time. I think the leagues and the associations need to have a plan. They need to work on their promotion, on their marketing, on their media coverage, uh, on, the, on the event character of the games. They have to make the league more attractive, which I think all countries almost uh, still have a way to Tatiana, improve. Tatiana, how, how do you do... Tatiana, I mean, you, I love you, the fact you've got a list. I mean, you should have a list. That, this is your job, <laughs> to make women's football more popular. But how do you do that? How do you make the leagues more attractive, for instance? Let's just take one of the things you suggested there. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, I think there's not just one answer. It really depends the country and the culture of the sports. Yeah. And, and sometimes you, you have to fight big other sports. Yeah. And I just think media coverage is really important. Yeah. And I know in the US you, you go against big men's sports, uh, which are covering the whole uh, TV shows. And you have to make sure you find a spot for women's football yeah. or soccer. Yeah. Um, so you have to make a, women's football a product. Because right now it was a copy of the men's game. It was treated like this. It was in the shadow of the men's game and it has to go out of the shadow. It has to become its own product. And for that, you need your own identity. Uh, you know, you need to have your own media coverage and, and attract spe spectators and fans. And how? Um, I could give you a few examples, but it's maybe only true for one or two clubs. So uh -huh. I, I don't think that would be fair to all options, but uh, there are enough clever people out there. Right. Once the marketing people and commercial people start to realize the potential women's football has, then I think we're on the wrong way, on the right way. All right, Anne. Rachel, let me, sh let me show you this. This is the head of coordination for women's football in Brazil. Now, Anne said there's been no drama this year in the game so far. It's only been a week. There's drama back here on my laptop. Have a listen to this. A Marco Aurelio Cuna. Now the women are getting more beautiful, putting on makeup. They go in the field in an elegant manner. Now the shorts are a bit shorter. The hairstyles are more done up. It's not a woman dressed as a man. Uh, discuss, Anne. That's drama right there, isn't it? Or is it distraction? I'm not sure which. No, it's, it's definitely gained a lot of traction, particularly hmm. in the women's football You hid community. that story. You thought I wouldn't mention it. <laughs> no, it, it was just something that kind of came out. And, and unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, it kind yeah. of came out when um, we were still trying to figure out He's who was going to make it to the knockout stage. head of for women's football in Brazil. Absolutely. What? Absolutely. And... And that's one of, I mean, that's one of the prejudices a lot of the players have to face. There have yeah. been some great articles about what are the challenges female footballers mm. face. And, and one of them is, is the femininity policing that occurs in a lot of nations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me just see what the community is saying. Malika. Well, they're picking up on quotes like that because mm. he's not the only one. This is sure. uh, Shireen who says, solutions, <laughs> avoid commentary on outfits or how tired the players seem, stress the need for support from national federations, and this is the last and the biggest, you can see it's in all caps, watch the matches. That's how to increase mm -hmm. uh, interest in the Women's World Cup. I'm on FIFA.com right now, playing a little bit later. We've got Mexico, France, England, Colombia, Korea, Span Span uh, Spain, Brazil. So many teams to watch out for. Your top tip for winning, Tatiana, is? <laughs> you can only say one country's name. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I Go just on. hope that women's football wins. I hope you have great uh, matches. Oh, a great diplomatic answer. Favorite. And top tip? <laughs> Who should we bet on? I'm I'm the still going to go to Germany. Oh, Germany! Oh, wow. Ooh, yeah, gonna Australia is not going to like you very much. Rachel, who, should be, who, no. who, who are you putting your money behind? You know, I, I, this is a pretty controversial decision, but I still like Germany. I think that they <sighs> have earned their number they one ranking. Run and... Germany. Let somebody else win for the women. All right. Very nice. Ladies, thank you very much. Tatiana and Rachel, thank you for joining us on our conversation about the Women's World Cup 2015. Thank you for watching. Take care. Thank you.